Okay, in the last <laughs> class, quick review, just to get us back up to snuff, we looked at the ec economic tools that we're going to be using here as the key to understanding what was going on in historical episodes. So to improve our understanding, we're going to use these tools um, to really make sense out of history. Um, then we looked at politics as being a very important part of that and is the period leading up to the Civil War as a period of political realignment and more or less a massive type of political realignment, not just the election to election, what's going to happen to the Democrats, what's going to happen to the Republicans type of thing, but uh, a different type of an alignment, realignment where we saw all sorts of parties, minor parties, uh, political groups, special interest groups gathering together. Uh, we saw the Whigs, which were the descendant party of the Federalist Party, the Know Nothing Party, the Free Soil Party, uh, more or less third, fourth level parties, uh, as well as groups like the Abolitionists and the Prohibitionists, all coming together really under the banner of the Republican Party during the 1850s. So prior to the Republicans forming, the Democrats really were in majority control of American politics, and that meant that the South, uh, which was more Democrat, um, had political power, and their philosophy was one that was conducive to economic growth with, three, with free market economy. Uh, the Republicans, on the other hand, were a party of change. Now, that's, that phrase is often used, but it's, they never specify whether it's change for the good or change for the bad. Um, I do want to mention a point that Harry brought up after class, appropriately so, last week, um, when he asked about was, wasn't the Republican Party's platform on distribution of the land more libertarian than the Democrats. Remember, the Democrats wanted to sell the land to Americans, have the federal government sell the land, where the Republicans wanted homesteading, to give away free land to settlers. And you have to admit, yes, the Republican approach was, in general, more libertarian. Of course, we're not strictly concerned with the philosophies and who's right and who's wrong, but this is a case where the, uh, the Democrats were maybe less free market, in a sense. Um, but that's the nature of the game. We're not dealing with ideal types. We're not dealing with black and white, yes or no, good and bad. We're dealing with political parties, which are organizations with a lot of different interests and certainly not all in the interest of the general interest of society. The third point we looked at was tariffs, trying to come to grips with the idea that tariffs were the cause of the war. And we looked at various evidences, groups of evidences, uh, the Collier and Hoffler studies, which in examining other civil wars, find that it's almost never a matter of race and uh, ethnic groups and different societies, different culture, it's almost always a battle for some key resource, which would lend credence to the idea that it was that key agricultural resource in the South that exported wealth, um, creating wealth, uh, in the form of ec cotton exports. Two other things, if you're more interested in this, than we have time for here, uh, two people that have addressed this issue in more detail about tariffs being the cause of the war, Charles Adams and his book, When in the Course of Human Events. When in the Course of Human Events. A very interesting, very good read, um, short, very historical, multifaceted, uh, highly recommended. The other is Thomas DiLorenzo, D-I-L-O-R, 
E-N-Z-O. In Tom's book, The Real Lincoln, um, really addresses many topics about Lincoln from historical, from a historical <coughs> factual point of view, um, but in particular the issue of tariffs versus slavery as a cause of the war. And both of these fellows, their books are based on the historical facts as we still know them from that time period. So both of those books are really worth looking at, both highly readable. Uh, uh, very they're available in the library, I mean in the bookstore? Uh, we sell them, but uh, a lot of times I've seen both of those books, um, you know, not the, where they're sold out temporarily, yeah. but generally we do carry them. Mm-hmm. Now, further evidence, um, some of the aspects of tariffs, Uh, that we know from today. Uh, The first is is that tariffs would protect northern industry. In particular, the iron industry uh, centered in Pennsylvania and the textile industries in New England, Uh, just as today. I mean, this is theoretical uh, economic theory that we know that if you put protective tariffs, that's going to benefit the local industry. They can raise their prices, they can sell more, they're protected from foreign competition. So it's definitely in their interest to have this type of protectionism. We also know that tariffs would hurt the southern farmer. Even though they're not tariffs on cotton and tobacco, they're tariffs on imported goods like clothing, um, like iron goods, cooking, cookware, um, agricultural tools. These are things that Southerners were buying. They weren't making themselves. They, and they had to buy them either from Northern industries or European industries. Uh, there, was a, there was little industry in the South um, in places like Richmond, Virginia, um, Nashville, uh, but not much. Birmingham, Birmingham, there was no Birmingham at this point. There was no Atlanta at this point. What about Tredegar Ironworks in Rich, Richmond? Yes. They were a steel producing, they were probably one of the, 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 the most productive of any of the Confederates. But, uh, yeah, they were definitely the biggest, I think, both before and during the war. Yeah. Um, and they, they ended up producing a lot of. Uh, military goods for the Confederacy during the war. But in any case, these tariffs would be harmful to southern uh, people, southern farmers in particular. Um, The trade between Europe, cotton for goods, would be reduced. Uh, And so this was something that would definitely be favorable to the North and be unfavorable to the South. Uh, It also creates revenue for the government to spend. Um, and this is something the Republicans <coughs> wanted to do. The Republicans have traditionally supported public works projects where the Democrats, uh, at least back then, uh, modern Democrats support just about everything in terms of spending. But uh, they were not pro-public works projects at the federal level. Democrats, like if you looked at the Georgia legislature, you would see them, uh, Democrats, supporting public works projects, but they didn't want the federal government to do it because they thought that they might not get their fair share. And tariffs were a key political battle for 40 years at least. I mean, really, our entire history, um, but certainly in the decades before the Civil War, that was the prime political battle line. And if you read the history of that time period, which most people uh, don't read uh, the history of that time period, it's, uh, it's the period where we don't remember any of the presidents' names. Um, the cowboys and Indians haven't really started up in full force. And so that's kind of, you know, it's not the interesting historical period for most people and television producers. So we don't get a good, but that's really the tariff of abominations, 
uh, the tariff of 1824, the tariff of 1828-32, and so on. It was a big political battle. Um, economists and uh, social scientists have looked at these uh, issues, and they found that it really is important that voting, for example, in Congress was decided on this basis. In other words, if you were from a district in Pennsylvania that had a steel or iron factory, um, iron foundry, excuse me, um, you would be voting for tariffs. If you were representing um, cotton plantations in Mississippi, you would be against it. And the votes from that period really fall along those lines. And you can look at the, en the uh, evidence from Pincus, P-I-N-C-U-S, that's in the book. It lays out where the congressmen and the senators were from north, south, east, and west, and how they voted yes or no. Okay. So a little has changed. <laughs> well, yes. Um, in, in, in many respects, um, the generalized forces of how things go on in Washington, uh, they, they don't change that much. Now, industries do change. Um, all the time. Comparative advantage changes. It's something that's very difficult for people to get used to, you know, especially if you've worked in an industry for 25 years and then all of a sudden your job is in jeopardy. You know, you, you can't help but think that's unfair, but um, people gain and lose comparative advantages. And uh, the South right now uh, for example, is losing its comparative advantage in the production of tobacco. And there's a lot of skeptics out there that say that we may lose our comparative advantage in cotton, uh, while at the same time sort of strengthening our comparative advantage in the production of pulp and paper and wood products. Uh, so it happens all the time. Uh, the state of Alabama, we had nothing to do with the automobile industry except producing maybe a little bit of steel for some part suppliers. Now, <coughs> we're one of the fastest growing automobile producers in the nation. Um, at the same time, we've lost textiles. So those types of things do change, but the political advantage. comparative advantage, absolutely. And that's really a very important key to understanding the first, the, excuse me, the second major chapter, the Union blockade and Southern strategy. When the South seceded and the war essentially began, Lincoln, of course, was calling up troops and cons consulting with his generals, and the major general. Uh, the top general in the Union Army uh, was Winfield Scott. And Scott developed what was called the Anaconda Plan. Uh, it was actually first dubbed the Boa Constrictor Plan, but ultimately it was came out as the Anaconda, the um, uh, basically a snake that surrounds the body and squeezes the breath out of its prey until death ensues. The Anaconda Plan was designed to, um, let's see if I can, give you some idea of what we're talking about here. Let's see. Kentucky. What am I missing here? Arkansas. Well, we'll throw that in there. Um, the idea of the Anaconda Plan was it had several parts to it, but the first and main part was to establish a blockade around 
the Confederate States, around the rebelling states, so that uh, boats would be stationed at all the ports Galveston, um, around the Confederacy uh, to prevent ships from coming in and to prevent ships from going out. And so the idea was to establish a blockade like a snake that would constrict the trade of the southern economy. And then, of course, the army would provide the, uh, the full land area where they couldn't trade through. And then also, an interesting part of the plan is to send an army down the Mississippi River and a navy and army into New Orleans to essentially cut the Confederacy in two. Okay, to increase the strangulation, to prevent trade from crossing, and also, uh, interestingly, to capture some of the best cotton-growing land because the, the South, cutting the, the South out of the northern economy actually is hurting the northern textile industries. They needed cotton as well. And so this was their basic plan to surround, to constrict, um, to create economic pain and hopefully Union sympathizers in the South would throw the fire eaters out of state government and then the state governments would propel the Confederacy to um, basically to give up the war effort. So that's the northern, the northern strategy, the Anaconda Plan. And the key thing in the Anaconda Plan is this blockade. The southern strategy is often referred to as the King Cotton strategy. By 1860, uh, southerners, cotton growers were growing very rich, very wealthy. Uh, production was increasing, more land was coming under cultivation. Um, cotton was king in terms of world trade. It was the fuel driving the Industrial Revolution. You very rarely hear that connection, but the Industrial Revolution in Europe was basically the Europeans taking the textile industry away from India um, and producing clothing for Europeans and other people around the world using cotton from the South. King Cotton strategy was to say, okay, we got the power. We're going to cut off cotton exports from the rest of the world and force the Europeans to come over and smash up this blockade. Okay, so both general strategies of the war were basically aimed at cotton, basically involving either a blockade or having the blockade being torn apart by the Europeans, the French and the, and the English. And so while, again, I've made this point very early on in the class about our emphasis on the land battles and the cannons and the horses and the patriotism and the heroism and the generals and the leadership and the strategy on the land, actually what we find is that the real key to the war is this battle at sea, which is almost an afterthought. I took a course, an undergraduate course, in Civil War history, and it was absolutely fabulous. We had maps and battles and all sorts of great stuff. Very, very little emphasis on the war at sea. But let's take a look. The land battle was a stalemate. For years, the land battle was a stalemate. 
you basically had relatively equally weighted armies. You had leaders, generals, who were all trained at West Point. You had the same tactics, you had the same strategies, roughly speaking. You had the same uniform design, the same weapons, the same bullets, the same um, carriages, cannons, roughly equal, and that land battle was generally a stalemate. We see the war as this battle at sea. And it's the most unusual of all battles between the runners, the blockade runners, the rep butlers of the time, and the blockaders, the Union Navy, which gets almost no attention in the history or the cinema of the Civil War. Both sides were ultimately profit motivated. Blockade runners were, of course, private citizens. They wore no uniforms and they shot, they didn't shoot guns at the enemy. I mean, they may have had some guns on board, but they didn't have cannons and they didn't try to shoot the Union um, blockade fleet. As a matter of fact, they usually gave up pretty quickly. If a Union blockade er saw a blockade runner, and typically what would happen is they'd fire a shot across the bow, and the blockade runner would usually stop and be taken over without any kind of fuss, because the the um, the uh, sailors on the blockade runners would be returned to a Union port where they would have a good time for a few days and then sign up with another blockade running ship. Uh, the ship itself would be sold uh, in many cases to another blockade runner. Why didn't they cat on the cabs of these guys and, and turn them? And so that, I mean, sooner or later they'd run out of proficient crews, wouldn't they? Well, they were, a lot of them were European, so there was a pretty good supply of, of yeah. people willing to do that. Um, and they did, they did uh, take some of those ships. If they thought that a ship would be, make a good blockader, then the Union, the Union Navy would take that and outfit it with guns uh, because they needed some of the faster boats to chase yeah. down the, the blockade runners. Yeah. Now, the blockaders, another interesting story, uh, the blockaders were also profit-motivated. Um, if a blockader captured a blockade runner, the crew was paid bounties. So the captain got so much, first mate got so much of a share, and it went on down until you got to the lowest level of troops um, who would get the smallest share of whatever they could sell the cotton for and the boat. So the blockade blockaders capture the boat, sell it, and keep the profits, essentially. So they were very interested in capturing these boats, but they were not interested in destroying them. So they never like rammed the blockade runner because then that would mean that they wouldn't get paid. So it's very interesting that both sides never fired at each other in the way that armies and people at war do, and that both sides were almost purely profit motivated. So it's a, I think this is what enhances the, the, the the role of economic analysis in this type of war. Now, the blockade and blockades in general are very leaky affairs, and this one was called a leaky affair. They're usually ineffective. Uh, blockades uh, in general don't work very well. You know, the United States and the UN had a blockade of Iraq for years and years and years, and you know, every time we sent over newspaper reporters or TV reporters, they had goods from all over the world on their shelves. Uh, they were still hungry and impoverished, but there was never any lacking of, you know, if you had enough money, you could still get medicines and uh, radios and, you know, the latest DVD um, from the United States. 
So if blockades are leaky, and if this one was Ill leaky and ineffective as most others are, the Confederacy should have won. And, but it needed to be a leaky affair. It needed to be ineffective because the southern economy was so highly specialized. They had spent so many years concreting in their comparative advantage in cotton production based on plantation uh, agriculture and slave labor um, that if it wasn't ineffective, if the blockade was effective, it would be highly detrimental to the southern economy and the Confederate war effort. Of course, wasn't one of the reasons why it was very leaky, uh, uh, was not leaky, uh, was the fact that the, the, the South, uh, South gradually went to withhold from the market its primary product, which was cotton. Yeah. And, and if, so if that was not marketable, if, if, there, if, if someone could not come to our ports and buy it, then we would, of course, we would come. We would, well, it, it certainly seems so in retrospect, but they were convinced that this King Cotton strategy, that that was their real power, and but they never actually organized it in an effective way. Um, the Confederate Congress uh, set out to establish a cotton embargo, but they never really passed an effective cotton embargo at the national level. States and local harbors passed legislation and, and resolutions calling for an embargo of cotton, and there was a lot of extra legal pressure where people would basically be threatened if they were aggressively exporting uh, their cotton. And exports did fall. I mean, whether or not it was enforced, whether or not they passed it, exports officially fell dramatically uh, during the first year of the war. The official estimate is something like 99%, but it's probably more likely that it was had fallen by 90, 85 to 90%. But this doesn't look good. I mean, in, in one sense, if you're, you're advocating an, um, an embargo, well, and your exports are falling, you could say you had an embargo, but over in Europe, there was still plenty of cotton. Uh, the Europeans were storing large amounts of cotton, uh, just starting to get cotton from other sources, and so cotton wasn't really in short supply. So while the Confederates were saying there was an embargo, the Europeans didn't really feel it all that much. So um, it really wasn't effective in the sense that people could call for the British Navy or the French Navy to go and break up that blockade. It also says something about the the blockade itself. Um, you know, if you call for a blockade as Lincoln did, and yet you can't enforce it, then it can be declared illegal. The British could have said, you know, you really don't have boats all along here. So if you're not enforcing your blockade, we demand the right to declare it illegal and to continue free and un uninterrupted um, trade. So the whole situation um, and the Confederate King Cotton strategy uh, made it so confusing, so really as to make it almost impossible for the Europeans to intervene. That's the, that was the southern strategy, is to get the Europeans to intervene on their behalf. But what was actually going on made it very difficult for the Europeans, because they're saying, well, you know, there's plenty of cotton over here, so there's no push from the public to intervene. And also, because there's no exports coming out, then we have to say we can't say that the blockade is an illegal paper blockade. It would have been far better if the South had either done one way or the other. If they had had a strict, strictly enforced embargo, which they really would have had a hard time doing, or whether they had aggressively exported their cotton into Europe. 
If they had aggressively exported cotton into Europe, they would have demonstrated that the blockade was illegal and permitted the Europeans to intervene. <coughs> Yes. Your, your comments suggest about about this uh, British view of the blockade sort of suggests that there's some international forum or context in which a country's blockade would be judged to be either legal or illegal. Is that the case? Or I mean, what what would keep the British from? Uh, Ignoring whether there was a government uh, uh, back blockade or not, if they felt that uh, they wanted to get cotton out of the out of the war. Well, that's a good question, and unfortunately, it's not really my area of expertise. Um, international maritime law, international law of this period, you know, basically had these concepts of. Uh, legal and illegal uh, em embargoes and uh, blockades and things of that nature, and um, there was no there was no United Nations or anything like that. There were agreements and treaties um, to which nations signed on to. So the United States and Britain and France and other countries were basically signed on to international treaties which specified what was and what was not uh, an illegal... See, that's why they had to get... I, I, and I don't know the mechanism as to how that... if they needed a majority of the signers to agree or what, but basically there was this treaty mechanism that, um, that channeled these types of events. Those, Very, those were big and fundamental issues in the War of 1812, on the War of 1812, the uh, maritime strike, uh, mm -hmm. France, uh, England, and yeah, so let's look at, you know, this, the situation here. Um, you've got the South, which is this voluntary market economy, highly specialized and export-oriented. Okay, the, there's almost nothing the Southerners can do with this cotton themselves. It's basically not of value domestically. And the Union strategy of cutting off the South um, basically is, if it's effective, it's going to force the South to become self-sufficient. They're going to have to create either voluntary or coercive means to make the Southern economy more self-sufficient what Mises, Ludwig von Mises, called autarky. And um, I didn't see this, well, if I, I probably did see this before we started working on this issue, but Mises in uh, his treatise, Human Action, okay, we have the, the Institute produced the Scholar's Edition, which is a, an embellished, updated uh, version of the first edition of Human Action, which was published in 1849, the Scholar's Edition was published in 1999, I believe. And um, on page 825 of the Scholar's Edition, I want to quote you this commentary uh, Mises has about the economics of war. Quote, The European military experts slighted the study of the American Civil War. In their eyes, this war was not instructive. It was fought by armies of irregulars led by non-professional commanders. Civilians like Lincoln interfered with the conduct of the operations. Little they believed could be learned from this experience. But it was the Civil War that, for the first time, problems of the interregional division of labor played the decisive role. The South was predominantly agricultural. Its processing industries were negligible. The Confederates depended on the supply of manufacturers, manufactured goods, from Europe. As the naval forces of the Union were strong enough to blockade their coast, they soon began to lack needed equipment. Uh, question? Yes. Uh, 
the British uh, built the uh, U.S. or the TSA, TSA uh, Alabama, and they supplied all kinds of uh, of, of weapons and, and ammunition. The French the mini ball was invented by a Frenchman, and that was and and. Uh, Nobody's going to tell me that they, they that they had the mini ball at least at first in the south. If if the French weren't supplying them with ammunition and stuff, I mean that that was that bullet with a with a hollowed out uh, posterior part, mm -hmm. and then it would it would uh, the advantage of that was that they didn't have to put any any uh, ram anything else down there, and then when when the charge. When the charge was built, it expanded enough to, to meet the, the rifling of the barrel and mm -hmm. so forth. Well, as you know, the, um, the Europeans did provide military uh, goods and, and goods of all sorts. Well, this is another thing. Why couldn't Lincoln have objected to the, to the, to the England? Building the building the ship and all, all that stuff. I mean, well, Lincoln did. Uh, there was did. Link, Lincoln and the Lincoln administration did object to um, England, especially uh, as well as France and others, from intervening in any way. In particular, providing any military uh, equipment uh, of substance to the South. Sure, and they have military advisors. So the um, so what in in the case of that the um, the the ship that you were talking about the the English built a ship which was then subsequently outfitted into a warship by subcontractors away from England so um, and in terms of rifles and mini balls and all that kind of stuff that was not directly shipped from England to Charleston that was shipped on from 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 England to maybe Spain to Bermuda or the Bahamas or maybe from Spain to Cuba to the Bahamas, um, so that who was selling uh, these goods to the Confederate government and into the Southern economy was um, not British contractors or French contractors, um, and they were not selling. Uh, you know there was the, the, this limitation on them selling. Uh, warships, especially. Um, uh, this was obviously built in England or built by English shipwrights. Yeah. I mean, maybe on the island of Guernsey or someplace like that, but that's a technicality. I mean, that's like they're doing over there in Iraq. Right, right. That, 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 that's a very good point, but, um, you know, technicalities um, work in the real world when money is concerned. If, yeah. if there's money to be made, um, technicalities, yeah, they'll, they'll find them, they'll break the rules, sure, I mean, that's um, one of the realities of, of war, that's one of the realities of immense amount of profits, and the fact that the, the South was being shut off from trade meant higher prices, and higher prices in here mean that there's a lot of profits to be had out here. So if you're in Bermuda yeah, and you're still buying bacon at 10 cents a pound and you can sell it here for a dollar a pound and you know it doesn't take you 90 cents a pound to transport bacon for 90 miles. And if you can slip in there at the right time. Yeah. And then you, you got it made. Otherwise, you're in Fat City. Yeah. Pun intended. <laughs> um, so, you know, prices in the Confederacy were rising steadily, persistently, uh, extremely painfully for Southerners. I mean, prices were going up um, much more per month than inflation has been per year in our lifetimes. Okay, so in inflation was, even at the best stages, at least 10 times as worse as, than what we're having it. And in many periods, much worse than that. So prices were skyrocketing. Now a lot of this, 
uh, we're going to see is a result of just the printing press in Richmond running off more money. But on top of all that, on top of the monetary inflation, you also have the effect of this blockade, which basically means that what Southerners are producing isn't worth as much, and what they're trying to buy from outside is getting more and more and more expensive uh, because of the blockade. And, you know, the reason that there's a 90 cent uh, pickup here, and that's not, a, that's not an exact estimate, that's just for illustration purposes, is that these blockade runners, they might lose their boats, there's a risk of e being captured, and losing your boat was a tremendous capital investment. Okay, to be able to borrow or to have um, $100,000 or $200,000 in order to buy a ship was a huge amount of money. So it was a big risk. And also, of course, um, they were putting in, uh, you know, initially they used whatever they had, even sailing ships they would use. But they realized that over time they would need smaller, faster boats. Power boats. Power boats, that's right. Uh, steam power, coal fired, uh, small, sleek. Um, where you had to carry a lot of coal. And when you carry a lot of coal, every pound of coal you carry means you've got one less pound for cargo. And so smaller, faster boats mean higher costs. It's a higher cost to ship a pound uh, because you're using smaller, faster boats with more need for machinery, more need for, um, for coal. To, to run that to run that ship, so that has to figure in the prices. Actually, um, prices determine cost. So basically, as prices for these things were going up in the Confederacy, that created profit opportunities for these blockade runners. So they were willing to incur more costs. They were willing to invest in these blockade running vessels at tremendous cost because of the high prices. That's the, the sort of the elementary economic mistake. And I even I have to fight this is to think that cost determine prices. The actual relationship is that prices determine cost. In other words, if the price is right, entrepreneurs will engage in higher cost to get more of the product. So if the price of oil goes up because of our consumption or the Chinese consumption or European consumption, entrepreneurs will go out there and look for more oil in more difficult parts of the world where they have to dig down deeper through ice and snow and so on and so forth, or in the ocean, deep in the ocean. So it's these prices that are generating the higher cost of the boats. Mr. Mark, uh, I think uh, it's a concept or a fact that is largely overlooked by, by most people in mm -hmm. many economies. Yep. The importance of price in, in all economic activity is that uh, does not get the treatment and attention that it deserves. No, it's um, you know it's it's often recognized and then ignored, just just plain ignored. But that's that's the reality of it is that prices drive cost, and uh, we cannot emphasize that fact enough. And it's a, it is a, it is a thing that um, that even economists get wrong. On our blog this past week, um, you know there was a discussion that where an economist in the in his book was sort of making the argument that cost influence prices where the reality was that prices um, ultimately generate those those higher costs. Mark? Yes, George. Ford could not sell the Edsel at any price. Is that not true? He sold a lot, a lot of them, I think, didn't he? No way. He had to quit selling <laughs> so, Isn't what you're saying counterintuitive in the context of the free market? I mean, that, of course, the other element between the difference between price and cost is profit. And, and I guess I would argue that 
Yes. Yes, I mean you're, but you had the right mechanism there. It's it's the profit that's ultimately involved there, but it's the movement in prices that is going to cause um, profits to be either lower or higher, and therefore quantities to be adjusted and costs to be adjusted as well. So that if prices are falling and profits are falling, um, then costs have costs have to fall as well, and therefore the highest cost producers will be leaving the industry. So it works going up and going down. Yeah, unless they're protected. Unless they're protected, that's right. And the other element that, that I think is really important here is the lag between uh, decisions. If the price goes up, sure, oil companies go out look for oil, but if we go out in, in uh, 5,000 feet of water in the Gulf of Mexico, it's going to take us five years to find the oil, maybe another five to ten years minimum before that oil hits the market. Mm-hmm. There's a tremendous lag time, uh, and, and so if the price drops down, that's when you see people getting laid off. Yeah, no, that yeah. you're you're you're, ab- you're absolutely right. I mean, there's a big difference between bubble gum and gunboats um, and all that process. But if we keep our eye on the ball, that prices will be the motivating factor, and cost is the catch-up factor. Then we'll ultimately be able to be uh, figure it out a little bit better. Especially before the Civil War, most navies were private. Um, and that, except for Great Britain and to a lesser degree France, nobody had what you would call a navy. They would have some boats to show off with. Um, but when you went to war, you just said, okay, we're offering bounties and rewards and, and things of that nature, and private people would um, get commissions and uh, get um, you know papers from the War Department and, uh, and, of course, promises to pay. And it was basically, by and large, even for some of the big maritime powers like Britain and France, um, most of those historic naval wars fought by the European powers, most of the ships, most of the sinkings, most of all that was done by private people. And they were just, you know, they would arm them out and uh, get the sailors, um, you know, to go out to do battle. And, uh, but when there wasn't a war, um, the navies were, of course, all the private people were decommissioned and uh, the ships of the line would be stored, um, which often meant that they were and depreciating. They would go on half pay, half pay, mm-hmm. and unless there was, well, actually, yeah. So well, the, well, what they do is they put them on half pay if they, could, yeah, if they didn't have any use for them at that time, mm-hmm. and, uh, and they were lucky to get a ship uh, and get back on. But uh, could I ask a question there? What about the, the, the drug wars in China, where the British forced uh, Chinese ports open to to uh, to dope and stuff, and and uh, I think uh, Franklin Roosevelt's grandfather was was right in there with the British. The, the Delano was his name. Frank, uh, his grandfather Delano was. That's where he made all, and that's where he made his profits. A lot of American uh, ship owners, I mean, a lot of Americans, a lot of them in New England, were invested in that war. And the same thing would have happened in the in the Civil War if Lincoln hadn't been there. I mean, these guys were ready to, you know, profiteer. Mm-hmm. Well, there was plenty of that going on. Plenty of profiteering. Um... Of course, one man's profit is another man's profiteering. Yeah, they still had letters of mark where they let allow these ships to go out and take, like, take a Confederate ship, or uh, and uh, but not as much as in, like in eighteen back in 1812, or I mean in the last century. Yeah, that was that was um, 
a major uh, disadvantage for the South is that um, because of the blockade, uh, their ships of that nature uh, had a very difficult time claiming prizes. So they could go out, I mean, they had some very successful ships go out and capture a lot of Union commerce. Uh, but they had a very difficult time once captured of claiming their prize in a, cro in a prize court. Um, so that was a that was a major disadvantage. Uh, that the, in the, the the South really, the Confederate government never really addressed that problem. I don't I I don't didn't hear of anything or read of anything where they were actively trying to address that imbalance. As a matter of fact, what we're going to see is that. Most of what they did was to make blockade running more, uh, excuse me, blockade running harder to do. And um, so the, the, um, the entrepreneur, the blockade runners, uh, did not receive any assistance. Uh, their efforts were made more difficult. Um, the private Navy option uh, was not helped along in any major way. And so the, the entrepreneurs on the south side were in a very difficult position. And, of course, they were widely criticized for selling at high prices, uh, for bringing in luxury goods, uh, failing to bring in certain necessities and medicines and uh, things of that nature, things for the war effort. And so, you know, this was a very difficult business to begin with, uh, very risky business to begin with. As a matter of fact, uh, one prominent calculation of the profitability of running the blockade uh, found that over the entire war that the blockade running wasn't very profitable at all. Um, but those such calculations are kind of suspect. Um, but nonetheless, uh, other calculations done by individual blockade runners find that the blockade running was very, very profitable. But a key factor in this uh, was the capture rates. How many ships were actually being captured? And we have some pretty darn good data on the ships that ran the blockade who was successful, who was captured, who was sunk. Um, some wonderful scholarship done by a man named Marcus Price painstakingly detailed all the ships that ran the blockade as, as best as possible. Anything that was reported in the newspaper or to Confederate authorities and that sort of thing. And then his work has been updated by later scholars. The capture rates represent how many ships successfully ran the, um, the blockade. In 1861, the rate of capture was pretty low. In your book in figure 2-2 on page 37, gives this graph. Um, and so the capture rates for inbound and outbound were less than 5%. In 1862, as more and more Union ships take to the seas, and also when more and more ships are actually running the blockade, the percentage of captures in 1862 of inbound goes up to about 25%. And the combination of inbound and outbound capture rate is more like 35%. Now the, so initially the ability of the Union to capture blockade runners increases significantly. Now, both sides are beefing up their prospective fleets. The Union is beefing up its fleet. It's taking over ports in the south, establishing beachheads on islands, 
capturing blockade runners and converting them into blockade errors. Um, the Union has, um, by the end of 1862, they have New Orleans, they capture Galveston, they have Pensacola, um, they have uh, troops in the Georgia coast um, and other places, so that they're, you know, tightening this blockade. And yet, the blockade runners are also adjusting as well. They're getting better ships. They've stopped using sailing ships entirely. They're starting to bring on these um, upgraded boats um, into the fray. And so, after 1862, as we go into 1863, the capture rate on inbound and outbound um, actually decline. So the, it sort of stabilizes, and yet the blockade runners are doing a little bit better. Uh, and that trend, 63 to 64, continues at least on the inbound. The capture rate declines. On the outbound, it actually goes up. The inbound is, is more important for the southern economy because that's the stuff they're going to get to consume. The outbound is actually more important to the blockaders because the outbound ships are almost entirely loaded with cotton and cotton is selling at great prices. Okay? much, much higher than normal because of the Union blockade. So what we find is the blockade errors, the people forming the blockade, are setting their targets on the outbound ship because they know they can get more money, basically. 1865, um, there's, the blockade becomes even less effective in terms of capture rates but because so many ports had been taken over by uh, the Union at this point, the amount of goods running through the blockade, inward and outward, is probably much less. But the risk that these blockade runners face is relatively small. They've got great boats. They know exactly what they're doing. Uh, they're very experienced. They have experienced crews. They've got fast boats. Um, and so the capture rates are, are not too bad, but the traffic is drying up. And one of the problems that, the, um, that basically they're facing at this point is that the, this is the lifeline, the economic lifeline of the Confederacy. And it's being strangled. Um, and at the same time, the, the need for military goods is increasing because they've used up basically everything they, they have uh, that was already available. Uh, things are wearing out uh, and need to be replaced. And yet, um, you know, things are also coming through the blockade that are not quite as necessary. Um, even things like perfume, jewelry, liquor, um, fancy clothes, um, the ladies of Atlanta are still holding balls, um, you know, and so there's, uh, there's a major problem, a perceived problem here of, of luxury goods being run through the blockade instead of the necessary uh, goods that are running through the blockade. And of course this is a sort of a sideshow that we see in Gone with the Wind, where Rhett Butler has access to all these things because he's running the blockade so he's got cigars and whiskey and parasols and fancy dresses and fancy ladies and everything <laughs> well the fancy well, ladies were already here the fancy ladies are actually domestic they're not they're not being run through the blockade <laughs> although the, you never know I was going to say that the, 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 the land conquest finally snuffed out the blockade I mean the uh, blockade runner trade because when they captured these major ports. What was it? Wilmington is the last Wilmington in North Carolina was the last port to be to be to be captured. And that was the only 
And what I was going to ask another question, what about these blockade runners? Did they have <coughs> maps and stuff to, to land their stuff on shore without going into a port? Or did, did that, was that a, a, a considerable advantage or not? I mean, well, they, um, go in, they do all these inlets and these bays and everything, some of them that the, that the Union fleet never even knew about. They could go in there, couldn't they, and dump their stuff. Well, it, it is true that um, the, uh, the, by the end of the war, a lot of harbors had been captured or shut off by the Union. And basically, the Confederacy made no attempt to really open up the blockade or even really to defend um, the blockade. They had taken so many troops away from the home front essentially, and we're keeping them on the periphery, that there was no one really to defend a lot of these ports. And so you had, you know, home militias made up of uh, teenagers and, and senior citizens. Um, no. What's the value of Confederate money? Had a large effect for that decline, too, didn't it? Well, the it, way the war was going and the diminished value of the money. Well, the, the cotton was traded in gold prices, so that I mean they weren't getting depreciated. Uh, well, it was being depreciated currency, but they were getting a regular um, compensation for it. Um, but it is correct, and Wilmington was the last major port, although Galveston was liberated. Um, at the near the end of the war, and you know it, it seems that um, a lot of these harbors that were captured by the Union could have been liberated. They just you know they, they never really tried to do much to defend these ports, um, or to reopen them, or to do anything to help the blockade runners. Only in the case of Wilmington was the city properly defended and were the guns in place to keep the blockaders from really entering the harbor inlet. Yeah. And so now your your last question, Ozzy, you say you got one question, but you actually <laughs> usually get about three or four in there. Um, did, did they, the way he played it there. Yeah. Well, did they have any maps? Did they have any... Well, it, this is a very tricky business, and that's why I refer to the fact that they were getting better at it. Typically, ships would not run into harbors in the middle of the night, but during the blockade, it was much more advantageous for these blockade runners to slip in at night so that they couldn't be seen, or they couldn't be seen until it was too late. Yeah. You know, so that at night, when you're out in the Gulf or in the Atlantic, for example, um, you can't see a ship far away. Yeah. So the blockade runner comes up going fast, and by the time you actually see them, it's too late yeah, for you to they catch. Had, if they had guns in place there, so the guys, the blockaders, couldn't go in far enough because they they couldn't match these big. A lot of times they had captured Union cannon, the Dahlgren guns. They could really oh, probably one one broadside or what one uh, uh, broadside would blow a ship out of the water. So so they if the if the if the blockade runs could get in so far, then the guns that are in place would uh, protect them. They and that was them. and that was that was really only true in very few places. Wilmington being one of them, yeah, yeah. where the guns were were in a place where they could sort of scatter off yeah, yeah. the smaller wooden, um, the ironclads mm -hmm. wouldn't be really hurt by those yeah. guns, but they unless they tried to get into the harbor. Yeah. But there's probably only a couple of dozen places. And once you get from Chesapeake all the way down to, to Mexico, there's probably only a couple of dozen places where an ocean going sea trap vessel is going to go. Yeah, there's and our boats there that's got barrier islands, it's got swamps, and so forth. So it's mm -hmm. not like the coast of the north or the west coast or or volcanic islands. In other words, they, they were dredged out. They, 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 they couldn't they receive ships of. Yeah, yes, that, that that's absolutely true. But actually, the blockade running ships were of shallow draft, yeah. precisely for that reason, so that they didn't have to run the main channel. Yeah. Um, but still, 
you know, when I had that map up there of the South, it looked like a humongous barrier, but you're absolutely right. Uh, the number of places with harbor facilities was actually quite limited. And there were other places, um, like Apalachicola, for example, which exported a large amount of cotton. Most people have never heard of it, but at one point in the antebellum days, incredibly wealthy city and region um, of the United States, um, fascinating history, but it was basically set up to export cotton, and there was no facilities really to um, for importing goods that could somehow be used to you know to get it to the troops. Essentially, that was one of their their biggest problems now, is goods how to heavy. I mean, they yeah. had to have some. They had to have something dredged out and draft. They had to have enough draft to get in there and uh, deliver them. But Wilmington, That's Wilmington, something. Wilmington was actually very well situated in the sense that you could run from Bermuda and the Bahamas into Wilmington uh, with a protected harbor with two ways into the harbor. And then once you got to Wilmington, um, there was, it was a train ride, not along the coast, uh, into Richmond through the back door, so to speak. So that that was, and of course they protected that, that harbor fairly well, but uh, ultimately they, they didn't protect enough harbors to, you know, because we weren't exporting cotton out of Wilmington, of course. Mm -hmm. That's what that, so we had to move the cotton up to Wilmington if it was going to be sold out of there. While at the same time, the railroads have to be used to move troops and other things, and all the rails and all the locomotives were, were wearing out very quickly. Um, so this becomes a huge resource, uh, complex resource allocation problem. A single question. Yes. Uh, I promise not to get into it very I thought I heard something that seems to be crucial and sounded contradictory, but maybe not. I think earlier in the afternoon you, you mentioned that the price of cotton in Europe didn't go up dramatically and that because of that the French and the British, etc., didn't have a strong compulsion or strong motivation to get involved in the blockade issue. Mm -hmm. But later on you said the cotton price was high. Now, is it that the cotton price in the north was high, so it was geared to the northern blockaders, but the price of cotton in Europe was not high? That's a very good question. Uh, very perceptive indeed. Because it, can I amplify it? Yes. Because it seems to me that, that um, the supply of cotton, if the reason the price in Europe didn't go up was that there was ample supply elsewhere, then that was going to happen anyway. So, so, so the southern economy was was destined to have trouble if mm -hmm. the world supply of cotton was in fact rising rapidly. And the uh, intervention of the Civil War was just was just a was, was just a bump in the road uh, along the way. But they were destined to have trouble <laughs> relying only on cotton as an export. Yeah. See now, Ozzy, instead of asking more than one question, you should just amplify this question. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. It was very good, very well put. Um, what we have going on here is that the Europeans, I mean, this was not a surprise to anybody, and basically the Europeans um, always stockpiled cotton. They always warehoused uh, cotton, but particularly so in 59 and 60, there were large crops, um, decent prices and they were um, stockpiling large amounts. The Civil War breaks out and cotton prices start to move up immediately at that point. So that Europeans who are holding cotton at that point are making money. I mean if you're holding four cent cotton and all of a sudden it's nine cent or 11 cent per pound, that's big time. It also means that if your member of parliament votes to break the blockade, <laughs> you're going to be mad because you've just doubled or tripled your money. So they had the cotton, 
but the market price was rising on the, on the constriction of new supply <coughs> from the United States uh, into Europe, and per, in perceptively so. I mean, th there was a good reason for that because even though there was a lot of cotton being produced in the United States, um, not a lot of it was getting out, and a lot of the stuff that was getting out was being diverted to the north. And so um, you have really both things going on. So that. I didn't catch the stockpiling. That, that was the key. Because yeah. That, the build up of the Civil War, they had stockpiles. They, had, they, always had, they always had stockpiles, but more so at before the Civil War than was a, a typical um, amount. So they were able to carry over, and, and those who did stockpile made large amounts of money, I would believe. Okay, you mentioned in your book that they learned other sources also, like the Egyptians, the Spartans, mm -hmm. the Mormons, and the other yeah. Right, so they sort of filled in that short supply from the states. Yeah, it was... It was... Um, and what great right, cost. Yeah, the it's it's a tricky phenomenon. There's not I, I hadn't seen a, a great thorough study of of the entire adjustment mechanism that was going on there. But cotton was had already been started to be grown in India, um, Egypt, and some other places. And the beginning of the war and the blockade caused a rapid development of that as farmers in these other areas quickly switched from one crop to another, but um, the amounts of cotton coming from these other sources was slow really to develop. Um, you know, if you miss one crop, that's a whole other year before you can start, and you're, you're talking about, in many cases, farmers who have never farmed that product or harvested that product. So. Um, the results were slow, but by the end of the war, um, the cotton growing industry had been firmly established in, in other parts around the world. Yes, that's definitely true. Was there, uh, wasn't there a long, there was a classification of cotton, long fibers and short, and, a, and they grew a type of, of short in, in, uh, in uh, uh, in Egypt, the Egyptian cotton was at some where somewhere I read that there was superior, but not nowhere near the quantity that it could be supplied by the South. And then, of course, I mean, uh, I don't know for sure, but I think I read somewhere that the Egyptian cotton was rated real high, but uh, they couldn't produce it like, or, and I guess yeah. maybe in India too, they couldn't produce it like. Yeah, the, the, the growing conditions for the long cotton. Is, is limited, especially at this time, to very small areas. Um, sea Island cotton was right. grown in the United States, and it's, I think it's a long fiber and very similar to what the Egyptians now grow as Egyptian cotton. And so if you want to get the best sheets and towels and things like that, you go up to West Point and you get Egyptian cotton whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's supposed to be the softest, most longest lasting, most absorbent, and so on and so forth. So, but most of the cotton, I guess, that's grown in the South is grown for just other uses. Yeah. Um, utilitarian. More utilitarian stuff, exactly. And that's what the Industrial Revolution was all about. The Union captured, um, I think, a lot of the area where the Sea Island cotton was being grown. And, um, and again, the Egyptians were, I think, fairly slow in, in coming on board there. But, of course, now... Um, now they're, I think they're they're growing and selling a lot more of that kind of cotton. It's really, um, it's it's the hot thing right now. Definitely, definitely. Uh, Mark, will you will, will you tell us uh, in order, uh, presumably toward the end of the class, uh, what happened at Paris uh, after the war and immediately after the war and. Uh, how were some of these things resolved after the war, if they were, uh, that had given the, uh, the South a great concern prior to the war? Yes, I will. Uh, we'll, we will deal with what comes after the war, as well as how does that legacy might even still bump up to today. Um, there is 
a remnant, a very important remnant um, that is um, in some 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 trails to follow through history of the Civil War and its aftermath that I think are very important. And you know, I don't want to claim too much for a book that's less than 150 pages, but I think we learn a lot about American history by going to this pivotal event in the American experience and seeing those trails of influence up to the modern time, not just the other historical events that it influenced, but what remains with us yet today. So we're definitely going to get to that. I hope to spend a great deal of time on that. So um, we'll see you next Tuesday. Okay.